Okay, good evening. I'd like to call the regular school committee meeting to order. Uh, today being March 10th, 2020, 10 days before winter is over. And we are in the Higgins Middle School Library as uh, we normally are for our meetings. The meeting tonight is being recorded by the PVD School Committee's recording secretary, Leanna Harris, and we are also being broadcast live on PVD Access Telecommunications, PAT. The matters listed on our agenda are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. Uh, today we are very fortunate we have our student government counterparts with us and I'm gonna uh, go around and ask everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, for those of you that don't know, for uh, decades now, I think it's over 40 years, we in the city of Peabody have run Student Government Day and it's an opportunity for seniors at Peabody High School to uh, run for different positions uh, in the city. Uh, be it mayor, school committee, city council, uh, different um, jobs we have in the city of Peabody, director of public works, police chief, fire chief, health director, uh, all the different positions we have. I think we have almost 70 now that we do. And uh, it's a great opportunity for the students to learn a little bit about city government, what we do every day. And I also think it's great where we learn a lot from our students as to what's taking place in the school. And, and oftentimes at the school committee meetings, at the city council meetings that we'll be having, I believe on April 2nd, um, we uh, take a number of uh, motions that are brought forward by the students and some of them we've put into effect. They've been terrific ideas. And uh, knowing this group like I do, uh, having seen them over the last four years, I anticipate we'll have some tremendous motions and a great discussion at our meeting coming up. Um, so that is April 2nd, Student Government Day, and I wanted to ask our students to introduce themselves uh, and who their counterpart is. I think we have some students here today, um, also for our superintendent, assistant superintendent. So let's go around and please, if our students can introduce themselves and your position. I'm Jess Basilar. I'll be with Superintendent Kerbel for the day. Um, I'm Sydney Nagel, and I'm with the Administrative Assistant to the Superintendent. She's not here today. I'm Madison Eric, and I'll be Administrator of Special Ed with Carla. I'm Sally Nguyen, and I'm going to be the School Business Manager. I'm Rebecca Trong, and I'll be shadowing a school committee member. I'm Anya Saitlin, and I'll also be shadowing a school committee member. I'm Alexis Pathmichael, and I will be shadowing the assistant to the superintendent of human resources. Great. Terrific. Great to have you here. All important positions, all people that do a tremendous amount for the city. I, just, I don't know where the mayor is. The mayor's not here today. <laughs> I was ready to hand it over to the mayor, and I could leave. Um, but uh, it's great to have all of you, and thank you for running for, for an office. It's never easy to put your name on a ballot. You had to do that. Uh, to run for these positions. Great job and congratulations. I think it's a great program and you're going to learn a lot. Um, okay, first I'd like to start off if everybody could please rise for a moment of silence. Great. Terrific, thank you. And I wanted to ask, we have some special guests here, a number of guests today, which is terrific. Uh, first, I'd like to start off uh, with our Higgins Middle School Project 351 students. They're amb our ambassadors, uh, John Drogitis and Logan Lamazny. Uh, they're here today. I wanted to first start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we could go forward, uh, hear a little bit about Project 351 and um, John and Logan's plans uh, for their clothing drive that they do every year. And, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kerbel. Uh, they're going to, he's going to speak specifically about John and Logan. Um, before I do, I just want to say I know them personally uh, very well. Um, they are tremendous representatives of the PBD school system, uh, both in the classroom, on the athletic fields. Uh, they care deeply for the city, and um, they have wonderful families. Um, very fortunate to have them leading the Project 351 program this year. Uh, turn it over to you, Dr. Kerbel. Yeah, let me do this. All right. This is the press release that was announced. Todd Busey, principal of the Higgins Middle School, is pleased to announce the selection of John Drogitis and Logan Lamazny to the role of PBD's Project 351 ambassadors for the 2020 school year. Project 351 celebrates the ethic of service and youth leadership by bringing together eighth graders from across the state 
educators, service organizations, and private sector partners with the goal of transforming communities and uniting the Commonwealth through a shared purpose. Both John and Logan were selected for their exemplary ethic of service and the values of kindness, compassion, and humility, all hallmarks of Project 351 that they demonstrate on a daily basis. As mentors, student leaders, and candidates for National Junior Honor Society, John and Logan serve as role models for all students. Both John and Logan have been instrumental in helping to establish initi initiatives that will benefit the entire Higgins community. As pre Project 351 ambassadors, John and Logan will participate in a launch day event that just took place in Boston. Throughout this year, the ambassadors will engage with other eighth graders and strive to make a positive change through service and civic engagement, such as the citywide clothing drive in conjunction with cradles to crayons. Uh, past Peabody ambassadors, and I didn't want to mention their names, this program now I think is in its ninth year, and uh, we have some tremendous students that have been a part of this program that have gone on uh, to start to do wonderful things for us. Uh, last year, 2019, Michaela Alperin and Carson Brown. 2018, Emma Bloom and Mark Patarelli. 2017, Sydney O'Donnell and Colby Brown. 2016, Cassidy Butt and Col Colby Therrien. 2015, Michael Tanzi and Jack Woods. 2014, Jacob Gustin and Ava Marotta. 2013, Matthew D'Amato and Katie Wallace. And 2012, Bella Shula. And um, it's great to be able to add John and Logan, well-deserved, to, uh, to be our ambassadors for Project 351. So we'll do the uh, national anthem. All right. <laughs> Just a pledge. On date, you two have to sing the national anthem. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John and Logan, again, welcome to the two of you. Uh, congratulations on being named as our ambassadors. And maybe you just talk a little bit about the program, what's been taking place, and what the future plans are. So currently, we are running a clothing drive for Cradles to Crayons. This is our eighth annual clothing drive, and it's normally one of the largest in the, it normally is the largest in the state. And we've been going around to elementary schools asking them for their help, and it's basically what we've been doing for the past like month. Great, great. And then before we ran a food drive for Haven for Hunger, we collected at the schools at each grade level and were able to make huge donations to Haven for Hunger. And then great. we were also helping out with parent-teacher nights and conferences and all that here at Higgins. Great, that's terrific. When is the, uh, cold, uh, the uh, clothing drive? Uh, conclude. Um, it ends April 3rd and it starts the 23rd of March. Great. Um, and if anybody in the public wants to donate, w they just bring it to the school or what's the best way to do that? We're putting out a lot of baskets where they can donate all around the city or at all the schools. Great. Terrific. Well, great to have you here. Any questions for our ambassadors this year? Mrs. Dunn, I, I, I turn over to you. <laughs> Thank you for coming and thank you for telling us about your project. As far as the clothing drive, are there any specific things you're looking for? Are you looking for only children's clothing? Are you looking for summer clothes? If you could give us some guidance. We're taking any sizes for any types of clothes from baby to adult medium. This year we're actually looking particular for shoes. Those are in much need right now, so we're looking for those. But any size, any type of clothing from baby to adult medium we're taking. Very good. Thank you. Great. Terrific. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Any other questions for John or Logan? All right, can we take a couple of pitches before you go? All right.
Okay, terrific. And we also um, have some um, superstar athletes here today that we wanted to recognize. Um, an incredible accomplishment for some of our students. We have four young ladies who have really um, represented the city with distinction and um, have really brought a lot of pride to our community. And we wanted to recognize uh, those young ladies today, students from Peabody High School. I did want to ask our state representative, Tom Walsh, uh, to come and join me. Uh, Tom also has a, a presentation that he wanted to make. And do you want to speak? I do want to say something. Yep. Can I turn over to Dr. Kerbel now, please? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Nice to see you, Representative. So uh, could I ask, um, could I ask Savannah and Sadie and, and Dado and Jolene to come forward, please, with your coach? I have my coaches over here. <laughs> They're giving me the right names. And so um, I just want to congratulate you. So, you, so let's see if, if I have this right. Do you have this? Do you have the school record for 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 the four by twenty four by two hundred? Yes. So I just want to say uh, to everybody in the room, okay, that this doesn't happen by accident. That you don't you don't break a school record, okay, um, easily. In fact, it takes a tremendous dedication and tremendous sacrifice and uh, comradeship and uh, being able to work together and listen to your coach and eating the right foods and when everybody else is having a good time you're working hard because that's the only way you get to the state finals that's the only way you make a beat a record and that's the only way you become champs so i just want to congratulate you because it's just a lot of work okay and so this is just a moment in time that we we applaud you okay but we know um, we know the times that you spent alone, and uh, we applaud you for that. And for Coach, uh, I know uh, Coach Bronze for a long time. He would never, he would never say anything, but he's in the Hall of Fame for the high school. He's a Hall of Fame at Boston College. Introduced into the um, State Hall of Fame as a coach, so as a runner and as a coach. And so he's obviously passing on whatever his winning style, or his, mostly his attitude to you. And so I think it's great. That's great. Well said, Dr. Kerbel. And I wanted to offer you uh, all of our congratulations to each of you. Uh, three juniors and a freshman, the future looks incredibly bright. And uh, really what you've done is brought a great deal of pride to the city. And uh, it's great to have you here uh, to, to share our pride and to uh, to receive the, the accolades that all of you deserve. Uh, so congratulations to each of you. And to Coach Braz, uh, can't say enough about what you mean to our city and everything you've done to help so many uh, young men and women in our community. Um, you know, I just really want to recognize all the accolades that you get are well deserved. We're lucky to have you here in Peabody. Uh, I think we all truly believe that. Um, I will say, Dr. Kerbel has often bragged about how fast he was back in high school. He's a, <laughs> he was a Hall of Fame athlete, Peabody High School as well. So he agreed that he couldn't beat any of you four in a race. <laughs> but, he, but he did say that he could beat Coach Braz in a race. <laughs> and I do not believe that. And I think uh, we have the makings of a pretty good race here uh, coming up. Uh, we'll have to talk about that. Um, but again, congratulations to each of you. Coach, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to say about, um, about the girls and what they were to accomplish. I just want to give you that opportunity if you want to say a few words. That's terrific. That is an incredible accomplishment. I did want to uh, turn the microphone over to our state representative, Tom Walsh. I know he has a, a presentation he wanted to make. Thank you, Mayor, Dr. Kerbel. 
uh, members of the committee, it's nice to see everybody. This, it's been a long time since I sat in one of these seats here <laughs> at the school committee. But um, I'm just pleased to be able to celebrate with, with all of you the accomplishments of these four young ladies. This is really um, such a great thing for the city of Peabody, uh, for the high school. Um, and Dr. Kerbel was right when he talked about um, the, the hours and the years of um, practicing, training, and your commitment. And uh, your hard work paid off. And really, you are an example to so many other students uh, in the city of Peabody, in the school system. And, and there's probably some, some young people who are looking up to you saying, I would love to do what they have done. So you are an inspiration to a lot of people. I have a citation for each of you. So I'm going to read one. Uh, we'll fill in everybody's name. So, um, But this is uh, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts House of Representatives. Be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincere, sincerest congratulations to each of you uh, in recognition of winning the 2020 4 by 200 Relay State Championship. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expre expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. And this is presented on the 10th day of March 2020 and signed by Speaker Robert DeLeo and myself. Congratulations and good luck in the future. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We also take a couple of pictures, real quick. Let's take a couple of pictures. This stuff is outside. Okay, thank you, State Representative Walsh. So um, if there's no objection, we have a couple of presentations. Uh, but before we go to the presentations, if there's no objections, I wanted to just go out of order a bit. Um, Dan Doucette is here, our purchasing agent. And I wanted to go to the uh, transportation bid update uh, from Mr. Doucette. Dan, would you be able to come forward? Fill us in on the results of the transportation bid that was put out. Uh, good evening, members of the committee. Um, I come here only when there's something big. Um, <laughs> usually it's a building or it's a million dollar contract, which this one falls in the latter category. Uh, our current school bus transportation contract expires at the end of this fiscal year, uh, and it behooves our team to go out early in the year uh, to grab 23 buses away from somebody else and get the best deal that we can, uh, the earliest that we can, and lock it in uh, so that uh, we have at least a little bit of predictability for next year's budget. Uh, we opened bids on the 19th of February. We received two bids, but they were both companies that either work for us now or worked for us in the past. Um, there are fewer companies in the bus business in this part of the state than there used to be, so uh, it does uh, make for a lower amount of bids than back in the day, but 
um, two qualified and, and good companies who have a track record. Our low bid was from our current provider, Healy Bus. Uh, it's a three-year contract price locked, that is to say, uh, they cannot apply for a price increase until the fourth and fifth option years. Uh, the bid price uh, annual cost is $1,440,306. Uh, that is a cost increase compared to the current contract of $16,270.20, which when you figure in uh, just the prevailing wage increase of 2%, uh, coming in at 1.1% over was a uh, very good number. As I said, it's predictable. Uh, you will not have to uh, deal with an increase uh, until three years from now. So uh, with the help of the, the team, uh, with particular help to the transportation department and, and uh, the business manager, uh, we've received all of the supporting information to make sure that they are continued to be qualified and will, we'll, uh, I think, it has to go through a recommendation of the superintendent to award, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Great. Thank you, Mr. DeSent. Thank you for your hard work on this. Any questions from the committee members? Okay. And what would be the next step? Uh, Dan? I believe it's a superintendent's recommendation for award. There's a rather obscure part of the state law that says that there is a requirement for a school committee vote. Great. Um, they've received a preliminary notice of award and contract. All their paperwork is in order. And uh, we will circulate the contract upon approval of the uh, school committee. Motion to follow the recommendation of the superintendent to award Healy Bus a three-year contract under the terms presented by Mr. Doucette. Second. Great. I've heard the motion by Mr. Hockman, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Uh, any comments on the motion? Hearing none, we'll go to a roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dan. And if you'll notice, I wore my Higgins badge uh, just because last time I did this, we were at the Kiley, so. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. You can join us anytime, Mr. Dusap. Okay. All right, we have a couple of presentations today. Um, go back to the regular agenda. Uh, for kids only, update. Um, do we have for kids only in the? I don't see any. Oh, yeah, I don't see Brianna or uh, Deb. Okay, uh, there might have been a miscommunication, so we'll get them for the next meeting. Okay, um, we'll go to the presentation of our digital tech team. Turn it over to, I'm not gonna call them the techie boys. Yeah, please, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Kerbel. You need to set up, or you're good? You're good to go? Good, yeah. good to go. So it's, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Chris Mitchell, Mark LeBlanc, Emily Moore, and Jared um, Haas. And this is, uh, did you say a dream team? This is the dream team. That's right. <laughs> It is a dream team. So I just want to um, just give a, uh, just a I just want to say a little bit because I don't want to take your thunder because you may be saying it. I had an opportunity now to work with these four, uh, with Chris, Lord, and um, in terms of the conversations where we started, I think to today, it's just been great. So I'm just really proud of all four of you and others who have chipped in. I know I'm speaking for Dr. Lorna and myself, that it's been a pleasure working with you. And the thing about it is, let's not get caught up and hung up in what we can't do. Let's not get caught up and hung up about trying to catch up to something that's right in front of us, okay? We're talking about what's in front, what's way ahead of Peabody, okay? We, know, we don't even need to catch up, we have to lead. And so these are the four people that are gonna present that. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, so historically, when we've come to school committee to present, we've often talked about um, projects that are very equipment heavy. Um, we've spoken about our one-to-one -one program, phone system replacement, 
um, you know, network infrastructure overhauls. Um, this is actually very different. So what we're discussing today is a concept we've been working on, um, this small team along with Dr. Kerbal and Dr. Lord, that really discusses how we can better support and improve teaching and learning. Using technology to improve teaching and learning. Um, circa 2014, when we were writing the existing technology plan, or, or getting ready to do so, um, much of the plan was based around this thought. Um, and as we've, you know, been meeting and, and discussing this new concept, we've, you know, come to realize that um, we're, we're attempting to improve teaching and learning not only through technology, but just improving teaching and learning in general, because um, that's really the ultimate goal. So, uh, Derek, could you hit the slide again, please? Thank you. <laughs> so, who spelled technology wrong? <laughs> oh, wait. I'm sorry. I read that wrong. I have no glasses today. Um, so, anyway, that was embarrassing. Um, so, uh, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, yeah, I'll get um, So, anyway, um, I, I, this small team has also been having discussions uh, recently, pre preliminary discussions about our next technology plan. Um, and one of the first things we did was review our eight goals from the existing plan. Um, and there are, and I realize the packets you received actually aren't in color. So the first, I believe, four goals are label were labeled in green. It was all green. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Um, the first four goals, once again, go back to uh, initiatives that were very equipment heavy. So, and the, these are the goals that we felt we were successful in meeting. So, we modernized our network infrastructure, we improved our Wi Fi connectivity, we rolled out a 6 through 12 um, one to one program, and um, I think that's everything I have on that list. Um, so, basically, what this tells us is we've done a really good job of putting equipment into people's hands. Um, and data that we recently collected via a survey that went to staff indicates that they're happy with the support they're getting on their devices. Uh, let's see. So, so leading into the goals that we feel we partially met or did not meet, um, these are all uh, PD or pro professional development or protocol related. And, um, you know, a, a question that we often get going into classrooms um, to, to, you know, do standard support is how do I use this equipment you've now provided me for instruction? And th these are things we attempt to assist with as best we can, but it's not necessarily our area of expertise, I guess. Um, so Mark is actually going to take you through the data as far as the um, partially met and not met goals um, based on the survey and the feedback we got back. <clears throat> so, one of our goals was before we wrote the next tech plan to look at what the future holds now that 2020 is upon us and that the plan is coming to an end, we decided we wanted to collect as much data on the plan as possible. So we sent out a survey to the entire uh, faculty and staff at PBD schools. Uh, asking just a few questions and trying to, um, which is on, it, are in your packet. Um, uh, this is the main. Uh, this is the these are the main spreadsheets. However, we broke it out a little bit more in in the packet as well. So I'm just going to go through kind of what we found. So the first question we asked was how they characterize their technology skills, and you can see based on uh, regardless of the school, they all feel like they're doing pretty well. Uh, everyone is feeling like they are comfortable or more than comfortable using technology and uh, their, the skills with that technology. However, when we move to how often they're using the technology, uh, it's lower, especially we see at the elementary schools um, is much lower. Um, so we have some thoughts on to why that is and we'll get to that at, uh, in the next part of the presentation. Um, you can see though that the bars, the red bar in the middle of actually every single graph is um, the highest. and um, that we think, well, we have some ideas as to why. I, I mean, that's, that's where I spend all my day, and that's where Emily spends all her day, so, you know, whatever. But <laughs> <laughs> you make your own conclusions. Um, so, um, so when we look at that, so we see that people are feeling comfortable, but they're maybe not using the technology as much as they um, can. 
on the last four bar graphs, we see that technology support is pretty high. People think that they can get their support quickly and effectively when things are broken or not working. However, with their professional development and their support in the classroom with teaching and learning, we can see that the Higgins, where we have a dedicated digital learning coach, um, the bar is much higher. And at the elementary schools and the high school, they do not feel like they are satisfied with the technology support that they get. So I'm going to pass it to Emily Moore to tell you all about what we think these, this data means. Next slide. All right, so this leads us to ask the questions, well, we put technology into people's hands, but did it actually change what teaching and learning looks like and how our school operates? Um, and the answer to this question is, yeah, it definitely did. Technology definitely changed how we operate as a school. We clearly communicate better. This presentation, we all worked on, and we're in different buildings. We're, we're not in the same location, and we can easily collaborate. Our students can collaborate. They can communicate better. We have been talking a lot about um, the coronavirus and what's gonna happen if we need distance learning in this district. And, Technology and G Suite and the tools that we have are, will most likely be part of that answer. So yeah, technology has definitely put our district on the map and it has changed how we operate. But did it significantly change teaching and learning and what, we, what I see or what we see happening in the classroom? And that answer is a little bit more complicated. So somewhat, right? We have tons of new online curriculums we have FOSS and Mobibax and Pearson, and students are accessing textbooks online. There's, we just cleaned out a whole library storage closet of textbooks that we no longer need anymore because that's all accessed online. And that stuff, that's awesome. That's great that students can access that information. However, if you prefer an e-reader versus a hardcover book, that's great. However, the task of reading is still the same. It doesn't matter what tool you're using. So if a student is completing a worksheet using a Chromebook on Google Docs, or if they're completing it by hand and then pass it to a neighbor to collaborate, that task is the same. That still could be, a, it's hard to know what they're doing, but that could be a very low level, not a very rigorous task. So technology, while it's great and at this point in the 21st century, you know, it's, it's a necessity, it's no longer something that is gonna set us apart. Our one-to-one -one in this district is not gonna set us apart from other districts. It is just like a blackboard when I was in school these days. So it's what's next, right? How do we change instruction and teaching and learning with the technology we have? And that's what we've been talking about. We sit in our office and we have these conversations about how can we fundamentally turn the dial on student achievement and change what our students are doing. And technology is part of that answer, but it's not the whole answer. All right, so this is part two. We're starting to put together our tech plan and we're realizing it's way more than just a tech plan. It is a plan to improve teaching and learning and technology plays a role. So that's what we're here to really present to you tonight and to talk about is an idea about how we can push our district forward um, and how we can play a role in that. So in pockets, right, so Mark referred to Higgins being a pretty good place to uh, teach and to learn. Um, I, I like to take some credit for that where we do make a good team. Um, we started a really a revolution here where teachers have been using blended learning, which is a model of personalized learning that um, students you, uh, have a voice and a choice in their learning. Um, I've been able to work with pockets of teachers here at Higgins. I've uh, also worked at the center school a little bit, and I'm gonna turn this microphone over to uh, Mr. B and uh, Ms. Orfanas to talk a little bit about what blended learning looks like in that school and how we maybe can change teaching and learning a little bit with the technology we have. Thank you, Emily, and Mark, and Chris, and Jared. Um, I, I think what we see at the Higgins is probably the model of where we would like the district to go. And we've been fortunate, fortunate over the past couple of years going back to when Jared had the position that Emily has now, 
where we've been able to switch from technology to teaching using technology. Um, as Emily mentioned, it's really the, the blackboard of when we were in school. And um, over the course of a few years, uh, Emily has been able to really increase the blended learning here at the Higgins. We started with a pilot a few years ago, one cluster worked closely with Emily to uh, take some of their lessons and turn them more into a situation where kids were looking at more digital content, they were taking more ownership for their own learning. And then last year, um, Emily uh, organized and ran a uh, blended learning team where we had uh, many teachers who <coughs> met once a month on their own time of their own uh, volition to uh, work on uh, what it would look like to have a blended learning model in their classroom. And it's really something that has taken off and it is um, largely a testament to the work that this team has done and uh, over the years how they've been able to turn it into something that is more about the instruction and more about teaching than it is about the technology itself. And again, as Mr. Busey said, uh, I think Center School on the elementary level, we got to experience what I think our tech team's going to speak about tonight. I had the opportunity um, with Ms. Murtag's support um, to work <laughs> on a professional goal with my staff and trying to get more technology um, instructional methodology with my teachers. And so we were able to offer about 11 teachers last year um, a blended learning after school 10 hour professional development course. And the teachers who participated in that, uh, that course, uh, Emily was able to coach them and really learn how to better use their beautiful pieces of technology that the school committee has, has provided for the elementary schools. And what I've seen one, one school year later is the teachers that participated in that coursework, they truly are using the blended learning methodology. It's so exciting to go into our fourth and fifth grade classrooms in, in particular, where the kids are gonna be heading to Higgins next year and using the, their own one-to-one -one computers. But the kids are, I went into a class the other day and the students were, it was FOSS science and they were working on a lesson on, on decompression. Yes, they had the Fox te FOSS textbook in front of them, but then she had a whole playlist of activities that the students had to complete by the end of the week using technology. Um, and by the end of the week, the students had not only answered questions that they would have done on paper and pencil, but shared it with the teacher, had an interaction with the teacher via the, the Google format, um, interacting with critique, and then worked in independent small groups to answer very challenging questions and put together their own Google slide presentation independently. And it was just so exciting and innovative to see the kids working that way. And I would love to see that level of coaching available at all times to all of our elementary staff to take our kids in Peabody Public Schools to the next level. It'll be very exciting. What do we need to be successful district-wide? Right, if we could just answer that question, I think we would, uh, we would all be very happy, right? What do we, what do we need to be successful district-wide? This is general for everything that we do in the district. Everything we do in learning and teaching is clarity, consistency, and communication. Clarity, what are we doing? Consistency, let's keep doing it until it works. And communication, this is how we do it. How effective have we been at clarity, consistency, communication. Again, we go back to the somewhat. We have been as clear as we could be, as consistent as we could be, and we've been trying to have communication that's uh, going to all different teachers at all, and, and staff. But what we're noticing is when we consistently have clear communication and we're able to have a mission and a vision that we can impart to our staff for professional development to help with teaching and learning, and we have the human capital in place the staff in place in order to implement whatever plans we have to improve teaching and learning, then we, we need a, <laughs> this is like the Batman uh, 
you know, I, want to, I want to have a shirt that says this. 21st century PPS uh, learning department. And yes, we're 20 years into the 21st century. So at some point, we'll have to call it the 22nd century learning department. But for right now, when we think of 21st century learning, technology is just one of many things that comes to mind. And what we need to start doing is we need to start thinking about all the facets that make up what does it mean to be a citizen of the 21st century. So what we have is a plan, not so much to add multiple positions, but really to unify a lot of what we currently have in our district. So what we're looking at right now is, let's start with the left side. On the left side is the current structure of how we structure the uh, technology department. And for a long time, the, the, what we worked off of with technology was, we had a director of technology, we had different support specialists in the buildings, and then we typically would have had one digital learning coach. So I was the first digital learning coach in the district, Emily is the current digital learning coach. Then we added the position later on of director of teaching learning and integrated technology which would sort of serve as an uh, administrator that would oversee technology and some other uh, teaching and learning. And as, as many of you know, I've focused at the high school a lot on improving instruction at the high school, um, not as much of technology the past couple of years. And we can see in the yellow, we have Emily's position currently in our, and we have other positions um, that we currently have in the district, but what we don't have is clear, consistent communication amongst all these positions. And the idea is, is that when we look at what other districts are doing, just as a comparison, other districts have done this for a long time. They've combined their technology, their data, which is, would be our ASPEN, our student information systems, and our teaching department. Because really, if we just isolate technology alone and say, we're gonna be teaching digital learning, it's another thing. It's an addition to teaching and learning. What we really need to do is bring together all the different facets of what's gonna improve teaching and instruction in this district. And instead of having to compartmentalize, bring them together as one unit. So really what we're looking at here is, keeping our IT department pretty much in the same structure, pulling in our data specialists, our, our two data specialists that work with Aspen at the central office, and perhaps down the line adding in a systems and integration manager. And the reason for this position, this would be a position of somebody who focuses on connecting all of our curriculums, our numerous curriculums. We, we heard the presentation today by Dr. Kerbel that we're adding a, our new uh, math and focus. That's just one of many curriculums that we're gonna to continue to add, many software packages, and every single one of those software packages needs to have an account created for every student. So now you talk about thousands and thousands and thousands of data points that need to be co connected, and we keep scores, have students score, and we analyze that. That's all done through our data office. But it's all related to technology, yet we have a separate department. So even if it's not the same exact department, it's still it's the communication between the data side and the IT side. Now, if we just keep that in isolation, that would be really successful because that's what a lot of districts have done. They've said, we want to combine data, we want to combine technology, have them as one, one unit. What we're propo proposing is taking what some of the districts have done and they've created a department of learning. And that department of learning really is focusing on instructional practices, curriculum, and assessment. Those are the areas in which we really need if we looked at what we, we need our support for from our $1.2 million, that's where we're putting our money into curriculum, instruction, assessment. It's the intervention practices in order to help teachers. And it's to help students to meet our goals of where they need to get to. What this department really is about is organizing all of these different positions under a unified banner so that we talk together, that we have a shared set of goals. And once we have that shared set of goals, we can work together towards the same vision. We're not working as an IT department, as a data team, as this group of coaches working all with their own visions. We're working as a unified vision. We can go into schools almost like a consultancy team and we can target what is needed at the school at that time. If it's an IT need, we can focus our attention to IT. If it's a learning need, we can all work together collaboratively, come up with an IT solution. This is what's being done in the business world where you can't just have compartmentalized departments all working together. You need to have specialists who are good at different things working together in a collaborative team in order to solve problems. And this type of creative problem solving in itself is an example of 21st century learning. So the whole nature of how we want to develop this department would be 21st century learning itself. Some of the other positions that we might see down the line is increasing what we used to call or what we currently call the digital learning coach, but that's very limiting. Because when you think of a digital learning coach, what's their job? It's to teach you how to use a computer and how to integrate technology. When you have a learning coach, I know this is a semantics issue, but it's a focus on student learning. And sometimes that's gonna be technology. And sometimes it's not. Emily talked about blended learning. Blended learning is not just about technology. 
It's about shifting how we teach. It's about focusing on the learner as the center of the learning, that every student has their individual needs. It's not just about a student on an individualized education plan. It's every student has special needs. Every student needs to be targeted what their strengths and their weaknesses are and know how to work with them. And blended learning is a way that teachers can easily or more easily target students' individual needs. Now to do that, to teach every teacher in the district how to, how to implement those types of strategies is a Herculean task. And it's something that everybody's been working really hard to do. But what we're proposing is can we do it in a more concrete, unified way where we're all working towards that same goal. So that when we come to you next year, instead of talking about a tech plan, we're talking about a learning plan. And it's linked to our strategic plan. Everything is starting to come together. And this is why I, th I think that when we talk with Dr. Kerbel about how do we make our tech plan better, teaching and learning really has to be the center of every single thing we do in this district. If it's not about teaching and learning, then it shouldn't be on our plate. And that's why this, this department is really important. I know Dr. Kerbel had mentioned a math coordinator in this 1.2 million and a possible future ELA coordinator, an early childhood coordinator. So we're only putting that up there just to give you the idea that as you bring on positions in the district that focus on curriculum coordination, they focus on teaching and learning positions, they can be put into a department so they're not an island onto, your, onto themselves. Because one thing I'll say from my experience being in my position, I'm the only person in my position. I'm the only person in my department, really. And Emily and I, although we both do digital technology, we don't have a department that we work together. And as a result, over the past three years, we haven't had a strong bond working together because we haven't really had the coordination and they'd be able to do that. Just imagine what we could do if we really had the time and, and, and position where we were working on the same department. And if we added more staff of like-minded people that could go into schools and make these changes and really help teachers where they need it. And again, it's not just about students, it's about teachers. All teachers have different needs. And we need to target t teachers with professional development. And right now we're doing the best we can, but we think this is a better way to do it where we can use a lot of the staff that we currently have, but then have a place and a vision of where those additional staff someday will go, so that there is that unified vision. This is my slide, too? Okay. <laughs> so, this is our theory of action. If we create a 21st century learning department, this is the big one, then we will unite our district stakeholders towards improving teaching and learning, following shared goals, shared beliefs, and clear, consistent communication. Now, if our mission is to improve teaching and learning, we can't go wrong, right? Because, again, we're focusing back to what we need in our district, having that connection, and we believe that using this strategy, we're going to be able to then solicit feedback from principals and teachers and administration and be able to figure out what are those targeted areas which we can help that don't have currently have support for and we can meet those, those targeted areas in a, in a more direct way than we've ever been able to do in this district. Well, that was terrific, and I want to thank each and every one of you for the hard work you put in for that presentation, but also just for what you do every day. Um, wanted to open up. Are there any questions for our committee from our committee members, Mr. Hockman? Yeah, thank you. If one of you wouldn't mind putting back up the uh, the graph of positions. Yes. So, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much. You clearly have worked diligently at this, and um, clearly articulated the thoughts that you've uh, uh, worked on, the data that you've um, looked at and communicated, I think, extremely clearly to us um, about what your vision is to move forward. It's a lot of material. You gave us a lot of material tonight, and I think I, for certain, need to digest um, quite a bit of it, but I wanted to go back to this because this is the implementation of what your vision or your, your um, presentation was about. So with that, and I think Mr. Haas um, identified that there are, for those that can't see the, the pinkish, or we'll call it Nantucket red colored boxes, <laughs> yeah. um, are positions that we currently do not have in the district. Right. 
Okay, and I think for those that were present, and I'm not sure if we were televised for Dr. Kerbel's presentation earlier, um, there are several of those new positions that Dr. Kerbel is proposing that we um, take on with the $1.2 million um, Student Opportunity Act money that the district will receive. Specifically, a math coordinator, um, an early childhood coordinator, and the elementary learning coaches. Okay, so we're still in your assessment and presentation, your vision. Um, you're, we'd still be lacking a systems and integration manager, a ELA, an ELA coordinator, and a library media specialist for K to eight. And a learning coach at the high school. And a learning coach at the high school. Okay. So um, I don't know who puts numbers on these things because that's part of what we need to consider in, in terms of moving forward. And, and we're unfortunately not living in an infinite um, monetary space. I and mean, we, have, we have limitations of what we're able to do. So I'd like to see the next level of this and see what that looks like. And I don't know if that's Mr. Scanlon or Dr. S Dr. Kerbel uh, or um, your department, your, not a department, but you're not a department, but you're yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're the individuals team. that are before we're us. We're a team right now. Yeah, yeah. the team. Um, because what you're saying, at least, you know, initial blush makes a lot of sense. Um, but, you know, and, and in order to look deeper into it and to kind of understand um, the benefits to the, to the district in terms of uh, student achievement, which is really what we're, we're looking at here and how to, uh, I really like, Mr. Haas, your, your um, recognition that all students, uh, whether on an indiv individualized learning plan or not, um, have different ways of learning and, and different um, uh, needs when it comes to grasping material and, and truly understanding it. Um, to the point where they can um, accomplish certain things and move on to the next level. And I think that that's uh, uh, incredibly insightful and accurate um, because it, it's, it, in my experience, it's true. And we don't always have that opportunity, uh, partially because we've been limited in the years I've been here in funding those tier two and tier three interventions that we're going to get to through Dr. Kerbel's um, Student Opportunity Act presentation and plan. Um, so I'm happy to see that. But there is another level beyond that, right? How do we get those, you know, we get the data to understand what the tier two and tier three intervention interventionists, who they should be working with and on what material, but how do then we get beyond that to the com comprehension so that we can move to the next level? And I think that that's part of what you guys are really talking about here. Can I just add one point here? Sure. I think our department really is focused on keeping students at tier one. Keeping right. students yes. in the classroom so that we don't need as many tier two and three interventions. And that's really where let's get 80% of those students staying in tier one. Right. Right? That's really the ultimate goal. So I don't think I need to make a motion, but I'd like to ask whomever it is that would be able to provide us with that information, whether it come in the form of a follow-up to this presentation or in a budget package or, or something. It's clearly, in my mind, clearly things I'd like to look at and uh, see. Um, with further discussion with, with the four of you, how we get to accomplish that if, if we can. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Uh, any other committee members have any questions at this time? Just a uh, notice? Just a compliment more than anything else. Thank you all for being here tonight. This was uh, very informative and very helpful. And I think you're all very um, forward thinking with this. Um, you know, you're looking at our district two years from now to 10 years from now. But what I think the big piece of this is, um, and you touched on it a little bit, Mr. Hockman there, you know, once we get those numbers and see what this could actually look like, I'm hopeful that in the long run, um, implementing some of these positions and these goals could ultimately save us money in other areas to make it more affordable and get us there easier in the long run. Um, so I'm optimistic about this. I think we have a long, probably many conversations to have um, over all this, but I think it's very helpful, and thank you for your work on this. I just want to add, just if I can say one thing, that a lot of our ideas here, although there seems to be a lot of Nantucket red up there, so, and we laid out in our plan, we have ideas about how to be able to build this department in such a way that the structure is there so that we can begin working together and begin um, helping the, the schools that need it, tiering our supports for teachers. Um, there's some schools in the district who need different level of support. Some of the elementaries need that 
basic technology support where other teachers or other schools in the district need, are ready for the next steps and next level. So to best utilize the resources that we already have in those yellow positions up there, it's just the structure that is the first steps to really, really realizing this idea. Great. Uh, that was well said, Mr. Arnotis. And, and you know, I just wanted to comment. I remember five years ago or six years ago when the technology plan was presented to us, um, I remember those meetings and we did feel overall the committee members and certainly from guidance from our, our team that we needed to upgrade technology. And I know one of the goals was at the time when the opening of the new Higgins is to, to move forward with the one-to-one one -to -one, um, uh, one uh, initiative at both the Higgins and the high school where each student would have their own Chromebook. I know that was something extremely important and at the time I think we were one of the few districts that offered that. Um, it was a big investment on our part. We also got a number of classroom carts to each of the elementary schools which uh, I know was a big investment and helped move things along. Uh, so I feel like as been presented to us we have met some of our goals. There's been an investment. I think we knew we needed to invest in technology. We needed to m make upgrades for our students and now we're at the next stage to, uh, to take the next step uh, and try to make the appropriate investments to, to get us to where we need to go and as was outlined uh, very nicely by the team here. So I think this is a lot of information that was, um, that was presented tonight. So I do think as been said that we need to take that all in. I know there'll be some additional meetings coming up but you know, I, I really do believe that there's a, um, a real inclination or a real desire to, to make these investments and to continue moving the city forward. Technology, I think, is critical uh, for the future. And although I think we've made some good steps over the last few years, clearly there's more steps that need to be taken. So thank you for outlining those uh, as you have. Um, Dr. Kerbel, yeah. do you want to move forward on that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I thought it was great. You did a super job. And I think it would be really helpful to the committee members if you would send the pow your, your PowerPoint to them so they can look at that. And what we'll do is we'll put numbers attached to everything, right? For, I think for us it will be easy because we know, we know what it's going to take. So I just want to thank you for all your hard work. It was great. I thought it was a terrific presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kerbel. Mrs. Dunn? Actually, oh. my counterpart has a question. Um, just, I have a quick question as a student in the high school. How exactly um, does, like, would this individualized, individualized learning look? Like, how does this further individualize um, how students learn in the classroom? All right, so I can give you an example. So one way in which um, blended learning tries to individualize teaching and learning for students would be imagine that you know, in, in, well, in a standard classroom, a teacher gives a great do now, a nice introduction, maybe he or she models what you're learning, you practice together, you do it on your own, and then a quiz at the end of class. That is a time-based learning. Everyone moves forward together at the same pace. Now, if you're a student that is struggling, needs some extra help, you might be a little panicked that you have to take a quiz at the end of the class. If you're a student that's advanced, you might be sitting there bored, waiting for everyone else to finish. So blended learning is one strategy where, so say the teacher releases all of the work for you for, say, a week, right, and you, she has videos and you can conference and there's different centers where you can go to to practice different activities. You can pick and choose the activities that are right for you. So maybe some are spicy. I, I like mild, medium, spicy, so my spicy are my, you know, harder, um, more challenging enrichment activities. My mild ones maybe are, um, have some more support built in. So you choose the activities that are right for you, or you use data. Maybe you take a, an opening quiz to see where you're at, and then based on the data where you scored on that opening quiz, you then, that might guide you some of your choices. You all might check in and conference with the student. As the teacher, this frees me from being kind of the sage on the stage where I'm lecturing and in front of the classroom. I'm free to coach and help students as they're progressing through their different sort of modules or act activities that they're doing, whether it's you know a center in front of me or whether it's an online activity. And then when you're ready to take a quiz or to show your mastery, you can go ahead and do that. And if, you, if that takes you two days, then as a teacher, I'm prepared with extra enrichment activities for you to build on your knowledge. And if it takes you all week, then maybe I'm looking at what you've, I've assigned you, or maybe I see that you need extra help. But the point is, is that I'm not 
as a teacher, stuck up in the front of the class or modeling things for everybody and forcing the class to move together as a group, you can choose your own piece of learning in the activities that maybe interest you. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you. Good question. Uh, Sydney, do you have a question as well? She has one. Oh. Oh, Mrs. Dunn, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank you for this presentation because it was so clear. And as I sat here and watched this and understood that we do not have time to wait for this type of a department. If you think of it right now, we have departments in this district where we have the English language arts department. Everyone in that department is working on teaching English language arts. We have a history department, for social studies. We have our you know, PE. We have our music department, foreign language department. Everybody has a lane. This department covers every single department in the school system. When they started out, they were the equipment people. They kept the equipment running, they told us what we needed, and they made sure that it was working because they drove around to 10 schools trying to make sure that these things were plugged in and running. We have advanced from that and now we're in a really good position where we have the equipment, people have been using it, but our students and staff really need this department. It's a coordinated effort to make sure that the technology that we have, to make sure that the equipment we have and the knowledge we have is actually being used by our students and teachers. And there's nothing worse than having those computers or, or Chromebooks or, or uh, I can't even list all the things we have. If those aren't used, because right now, our students use technology in their own life so much more than any of us ever, ever anticipated. If we don't do this and we keep the IT department separated from the, the teaching and learning, we're not helping our district because we need to be equitable. When we provide this equipment, we need to provide the education that goes with it and we need to make sure it's being used consistently. Every kid in this district is gonna take an MCAS exam on a computer. They can't cram for that skill of being able to type on a keyboard and answer on a screen. They need the IT department to make sure that that thing is working, but they also need to make sure that all throughout the year, our staff has had the support to be able to teach those students in many different subjects. Those computers are not to be used just for an electronic textbook. There is so much more to it than that. We really need this department now. And I think that that plan right there makes absolute sense because it, it's an absolute necessity in this day and age. If we want to advance the student achievement in our district, we are actually playing catch up with other places. And this would really move us ahead very quickly. They have an informal department. They communicate but the whole district needs to be on board with that so that they have the authority to be able to administer the, the PD and the, and, and the distribution of equipment and the being able to make sure that we're using this all the time. So I know we might need some more facts and figures, but as far as the overall decision to implement this, I'll tell you right now, I'll vote for that. I'd vote for it right now. Sydney, did you have a question? Okay, so like being a senior and starting off as the first class to be the one-to-one, -one, it was amazing at first. Having a Chromebook, we were the first class. It was really cool, got our own little thing. But freshman year, like we figured out that half the teachers weren't using them and half the teachers were. And it was kind of like the difference between using them and 
the newer teachers' classes, and then we have the old school teachers, which we also love. But now it's almost like I don't use it at yep. all. And I feel like if I were to have taken a class, like, freshman year or something to, like, teach us how to do it, then, like, that would have been better to, like, utilize and, like, have yep. an individualized plan. So, like, the incoming elementary school and middle school, like, they should be able to know how to use it. And, like, not knowing how to take a test on a Chromebook and then being forced to take a midterm on one was very scary. But I feel like if there's, like, steps, then the students would be able to, like, understand. Thank you so, so much. So I'm going to oh, speak to that. I love that we have a high school student here to say what I wasn't really super comfortable saying was that they get used sparingly or not sparingly, but in pockets at the high school. At the Higgins, I think it's pretty uniform that it's, the Chromebooks are used a lot and technology is used a lot. At the high school, it all depends on what class you're in. And for a teacher, that's difficult, I'm sure. Lesson planning, knowing that I don't know if my students are going to bring their Chromebooks today because they're not using them in every class. So the students might not feel that they need them all the time. So I think <coughs> this is a big part of that. And that speaks to, um, to what Bev said about um, we want to make sure every dollar that we spend on hardware is a smart dollar. We don't want to buy things just to buy things. We need to make sure that we're supporting that afterwards so that we're getting 100% of the usage effectively and, and out of these things. Same goes for digital software. So we're talking about math and focus. So we're adding math and focus. We want to make sure that everyone is using this, everyone's bought in on it, everyone feels like they're supported and trained on this. So that that's you're, you said it better than I could. I'm, I'm really, I'm really <laughs> thank you. And it depends on the course. Yeah, I was gonna. So, I, I just want to thank you for what you just said, and I want to thank Mrs. Dunn as well because both of you absolutely nailed two points that we didn't make tonight that we've discussed a lot, and, and neither one of those I think could have been said better. So just thank you both for pointing those things out. I have one last thing to point out. Again, also I want to say thank you. Um, the idea about individual like. T uh, having students pick their own pathways and use blended learning. Th the last two years at Higgins, um, my first two years here, I was really focused on teaching the teachers how to use the technology in the classroom. Because of our new schedule this year, I've been more focused on teaching the students to use technology. I will tell you, it is way more impactful on a school to teach the teachers to use the technology in the classroom because then they feel comfortable to go back to their classes, to lesson plan, to build their instruction around these tools. When I go in and teach the students to use the technology, that's wonderful, but then the teachers aren't prepared to support what the students already know. So the other big part of this is the idea that we can use coaching in our district to prepare our teachers to teach our teachers the skills to push the students in their classes. And I have to speak because all four of us have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> and I will, I just will add one thing. Uh, Ms. Moore and I are um, co-working on a new computer science curriculum for the district, a plan o over the next couple years, and that is, that is going to connect into how students are trained in utilizing technology in the classroom. So there is a plan for that in place. But this is really talking about, does a teacher know when to use a computer? I think that becomes the question because what you wouldn't want. Do they know how? But, yeah. but you know what you wouldn't want? You wouldn't want a teacher who said, my principal says I have to use a computer, so we're using a computer today because that's not useful. You also don't want somebody saying, I'm not using a computer because I don't know how to use it. So we need to teach teachers the right choice of when to use technology. But to go back to the original point of the presentation is about the teaching and learning. It's not always going to be important to use technology, but not using it is something that is a concern if it's never used at any point, because it is a super important tool in many instances. So that's what this whole department is about, helping teachers to make that right choice. Um, thank you, Sydney. Mm -hmm. uh, Jess, then you. Jess Talk first. Me? Jess. I just wanted to add on to what Sydney said. Um, I also experienced that awkward transition between the one-to-one -one program and seeing teachers that don't necessarily use as much technology and are more old-fashioned, traditional style teaching chalk and a chalkboard still at PUD High. But I was one of the first students on the START team in eighth grade, the Student Technology Assistance <laughs> and Resource Team. And I can gladly say that 
I myself, when I was a freshman, I knew when the opportunity was there for me to use technology and when it wasn't. I myself still find helping my teachers when they don't know how to use a spreadsheet or even Google Docs, the simplest of our Google Chromebooks, I'm able to help them. And I think it's really great that this presentation was made because we do need an emphasis on teaching and learning for technology in the community. And I just think overall the presentation was amazing and I'm a first-hand experience of how teaching students early about technology will impact their usage and how they learn and it does change the community for the better. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Su superintendent. Oh, superintendent. <laughs> she could be mayor this one. Assistant, <laughs> assistant. Dr. Lord, did you? Um, thanks, Jess. Yeah, I, I noticed I'm at the top of that list. I'm, I probably should be at the bottom supporting all you folks okay. because um, you've done an extraordinary presentation here. This is so far ahead of the curve. It's really great to see. And I want to share one thing. I, I might be out there already in the public, but the Massachusetts Department of Education approved our sixth vocational program last Thursday on criminal justice. And I want you to know that our next one, lucky number seven, will be an IT vocational program at the high school a year from now. We're going for that next. Just, that, that hasn't even come up yet, but there it is. Yeah, I think that criminal justice program will be terrific for our yeah. students. Yeah, it's awesome. Yes, a question. Oh, Mr. Miko. Thank you. Through the chair, thank you so much. I can remember, um, like the mayor said about five years ago, um, we were lagging in technology, and now we're about to do some great things. Um, and Ms. Dunn, through the chair, Ms. Dunn, you had mentioned MCAS on these, on these Chromebooks and, and, and students taking them. I want to go a step further on these. There are other districts who are partnering up with organizations to create their own assessments for students mm -hmm. so that someday we can say bye-bye to MCAS, and that would be the best thing ever. Yeah. Because if we, if we tailor, tailor instruction to every kid and then we give them the same test, how are we assessing these kids truly? So there are other districts that are looking into quality performance assessments. There are organizations out there. So I would challenge your department to seek out those organizations and if we can do that and partner up with some of these organizations, this becomes a lot easier come budget time, whether it's this year or next year for me to um, vote for. I love it, I think it's great, but I think we have a little bit of work to do, um, including the instruction piece of it, but also partnering up with organizations. Um, MCIEA is out there, a lot of districts are doing that right now. We're trying to get rid of MCAS in some districts. I'd love to see that happen in Peabody. And I think a lot of people would love to see that happen. So, but thank you, great job. Keep doing what you're doing because you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miko. Mr. Hockman? Just one quick final point. Yeah. Emily, you brought up about individualized instruction and kids look, you know, working at different paces and, and having the opportunity to master something in two days or five days. It also gives teachers an opportunity to evaluate their instruction. Right, so I mean, it, it works both ways, to, and all with the goal of improving student achievement. So Absolutely. that was a good point, and I just didn't want to miss it. I just wanted to make sure we got there. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Dockman. Yep. Mrs. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> one other, one other um, item is uh, back again to equity. We have worked very hard in the district to provide the one-to-one -one computers so that our students have access to this equipment. If they're not able to use it consistently throughout the day in all of their classes, we're actually not doing some of those students a favor because there are some students who do not have internet connections at home. So you may have some students who can practice on a computer at home, but you have others who don't. One day I came up to Higgins to drive through after it was built. You know I come up here all the time to check the building after school. And I was driving through the parking lot. There was not a car up here, and there was a little girl sitting in the parking lot, and it was dark. And I got scared, and I pulled over, and I said, do you have a ride? And she said, no. And I said, are you okay? And she said, well, this is where I can get internet access, and I'm doing my homework. Mm -hmm. And she was sitting in our parking lot, and the street lights were coming on. And that drove home the point to me that we've got students who are dedicated to doing their work, but that there are also students who are at a disadvantage because they can't just decide, you know, at eight o'clock at night to sit down on the computer in the family's study or living room and work. They have to work at this in a different way 
And if we don't provide those opportunities during the day to reinforce what we're teaching, we're not providing equity to all of our students. And I think it's, it is something we still always need to remember. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I was just thinking maybe um, the students, they like to stay all night. You know, they want to stay all night. <laughs> Dr. Kerr wants to keep our students here all night. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. I know. I was going to say, why don't you go home and do your homework? Or, um, Make a motion to approve minutes from February 25, 2020, regular school committee yeah. meeting. Yep. All right, so approval of minutes. Motion was made by Mr. Hockman to approve the February 25th, 2020 regular school committee meeting minutes. Seconded by Mrs. Carpenter. On the minutes, Mrs. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment to make. This would be on page six of the minutes under public participation. Um, I would like to add um, under the uh, speaker, Michelle Baker, Ms. Baker provided a document with her comments and stated that she was making an official, an official Freedom of Information Act request by those documents. So moved. Did we, did we, do we get a document? We did. I, at that time, I, I received the document and we turned it in. But this is to amend the minutes to reflect. Yeah, I just don't remember getting a document. Yep, we did. <laughs> okay. Um, was that given to the city solicitor? Pardon me? Was it given to the city solicitor? Yes, I forwarded it to him. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we vote to receive it? Do we vote yes. to receive it? I don't remember receiving an a official yes. request for Yeah, FOIA. when the documents, they were given to me and I made a motion to receive, we, we passed it unanimously and I brought them And then right it was presented to, to the city solicitor? Yes. Excellent. All right, good. All right. On the motion? Uh, on the motion, yeah. Mr. Arnotis? Yeah, I just, I, can we check them? Yeah, so yeah I, but I'm not comfortable taking that vote. I'm gonna withdraw my motion to approve the minutes and ask that this be tabled to our next school committee meeting. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall receiving anything, but I might I have. remember there being, not to interrupt you, I remember there being paperwork. I don't remember if we took a formal vote. And I also recall it no, more being. No, no, let me. Uh, uh, Mr. Arnotis has a floor. I also recall us, I, I recall it being a verbal FOIA. I don't know if we, if we received a formal written FOIA, which wouldn't, I believe, come to us anyway. So yep. I just would prefer some clarification before we yep. take a vote. Okay. Mrs. Dunn? Okay. When, the, when Ms. Baker spoke and she was reading from a, a document, right. after she completed her, her statement, she then turned in papers to me, as I sat here at the end, I made a motion to receive those documents. At that time, I did not look at them. I turned them in to Ms. Harris. However, in those documents, what, uh, what Ms. Baker had said was she was, she was making a Freedom of Information Act request. And in those written documents, that is ex what she what she read is exactly what was in her document that she was making a formal Freedom of Information Act request. After consultation with the city solicitor, he and I both agreed that it was in writing, and that that is why it has been passed along to the Freedom of Information Act officer. And I will tell you that I did not realize that until last night, and that has been re referred to the um, officer today. So it, it has been turned in as it was a writing. So all I'm doing is asking that the records properly reflect that during that time, during Ms. Baker's statement, that she provided a document with her comments and stated she was making an official Freedom of Information Act request. That is one of the things she stated during her comments. 
I'm uncomfortable with that as well. Um, why don't we hold that to the next meeting? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that went down. Um, but as long as it's in the city, sol city solicitor's hands now, mm -hmm. that's fine. But uh, I don't quite remember it that way, Mrs. Dunn. Um, Move we okay with holding that to the next meeting? Move on to approval of bills, please. Yep, approval of bills, Warren A, number 4433. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve Warren A, number 4433, in the amount of $3,061,264.90, subject to audit. Second. Okay, you've heard the motion by Mrs. Carpenter for approval of, approval of Warrant A, number 4433, seconded by Mr. Hockman. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 I'd like to make a motion to approve Warren B, number 4436, in the amount of $893,964.86, subject to audit. Second. Okay, you've heard the motion by Mrs. Carpenter for approval of Warrant B, number 4436, seconded by Mr. Hockman. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, go to. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to thank our students for for being here. Uh, great job. That was terrific. <laughs> I thought you wanted them here. <laughs> All right, now we'll go to continued business. The MSBA Higgins project, Mrs. Dunn. Any updates? No, nothing different to report. We're still in closeout. Great, thank you. Uh, fiscal year 2020 budget updates. Anything new? If uh, if the superintendent or Mr. Scanlon have anything that they wanted to present, or not. In regards to the FY20 budget, it's a similar comment that I made at the last meeting. Um, we do, we have recognized some concerns about the budget. We've taken prudent action. We did freeze the budget. It's going back a few months ago. Um, I've met with uh, Mike Gingras, the director of finance for the city. Uh, we have worked down to the specific issues. I have a understanding of what um, the root cause is of the issues with this year's budget. We feel that we've got money set aside. We can cover majority of uh, the deficit. We're still gonna monitor it for another month. Uh, when we start to present um, the initial budget for next year with you, I'm going to spend a, a fair amount of time talking about this year's budget, about uh, the way the uh, assumptions were made and how it was built and what I've you know, make some recommendations as we move forward. So we're okay with 20. We have a problem, but we're on top of it. Thank you, Mr. Scanlon. Uh, Welch School update. Uh, Mrs. Dunn, any new update on the MSBA project? Mm -hmm. We are actually on track to have our OPM recommendation uh, put before the MSBA at their April 6th meeting. Right now, we are completing the uh, submission after many hours of research and of interviews, the subcommittee um, came up with the finalization of the top three applicants for the position of OPM and then uh, selected the top candidate. That documentation is all being completed and submitted to the MSBA. Uh, Basically, as we speak, it should it should be in by tomorrow, and then MSBA will be reviewing it. They they, they we we submitted it 
um, Friday, but they, they sent it back. We go back and forth, they correct language, they want more information, and then um, we are still on track for that April 6th meeting. Okay. Thank you. And there is a sub, I'm sorry, there is a full meeting of the Welch School Building Committee Thursday morning at 10 at the Welch, just to update those members of what the, con, what the status is. Great. Terrific, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, let's go to item six. Um, redistricting anything, Mr. Hockman, on that end? It's probably more, it's more on me than on you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you said it better than I could. Yeah, uh, <laughs> let's hold that but one, please, to the next meeting. Maybe you and I can get together with Yeah, we gotta get that put something going. Okay. Mr. Chairman, um, one question on the open enrollment. Yep. Um, on that topic of the, the elementary school open enrollment, just to give you an update, um, there is a suggested form. Um, I consulted with Marge uh, Maccarelli and Joanne Brothers about what time frame would work for their purposes of receiving those applications. They gave me a time frame that uh, would work with the workflow in the office. Uh, they were suggesting a, a three week period, time period where applications would uh, be available at the school in hard copy as well as online that people would need to fill out that application and get it in during that application period and that that would be, that would be it. There would be a three week window for applications and then after that um, it would be up to the superintendent to decide where appropriate placements could be made. Um, there are also some changes to be made to the policy, and I had some suggestions on the policy as well. Great, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. I shouldn't mm -hmm. have uh, bypassed that one. Regarding the redistricting, um, any school committee member that's interested in the, being on the redistricting committee, please let me know. Mr. Amico? Can we, uh, through the chair, can we just get back to open enrollment for a second? Sure. Um, thank you, Ms. Dunn, for that um, update. Do we know when the applications will be available through the chair to central office? <laughs> when they'll be available? That was. We're still we're still working on that, but we're gonna sooner than later. I, I think we have a pretty good draft. We're just waiting for after this meeting. And, and, so. and the reason why I ask is we do have 350 students who are waiting on that. Parents, grandparents, guardians, their work schedules involved. This is something that probably needs to be prioritized sooner than later. If, um, speaking for the, the students and the parents and guardians, there's a lot of, um, you know, not fear, but you, you know, people are worried about this. Again, it impacts their work schedule, impacts their, their daily lives, it impacts where their kids are going to school. So if, if we could move on this sooner than later, I'd appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, just some information. Yep. Um, I will say that the only change is in the application time period. That would be really the only change. The actual process of notifying people, that's, that's lengthy because the superintendent needs to be able to look at the enrollment at the schools and that has always been done over the summer. And it has been, uh, reported back to parents, I believe in August. I'm, I'm not sure of that. But I know that it is a very, um, very precise uh, decision based upon the uh, projected enrollment at the school because we don't want to overcrowd a classroom by moving someone in. That's not going to change. And even though I know that parents get very upset if they don't get into the open enrollment program. One factor that has always been a constant was that this was never guaranteed. It is never a guarantee that someone is going to be able to go to the elementary school of their choice because the ultimate decision rests with the superintendent based upon the needs of the district. So as far as making work plans, daycare plans, anything like that, that process isn't gonna change for the families at all this year. It's no different at all. What has changed is the recommendation to only publish that application and receive it for a time definite so that the staff can deal with the, the influx of information. 
and also to make sure that people understand that telephone calls and emails are not warranted. The application has to stand on its own. There, there is place there for people to put information about why it's important for their child to go to that school. But the, the telephone calls, the emails, the messages, that is not going to, uh, that's not going to hold any, any weight in this decision at all. So the only thing that's changing right now is the application process and time frame. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Mr. Hockman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Ms. Dunn, um, the form that's in our packet, is that the, the um, application that you worked with uh, Ms. Macarelli and Ms. Brothers up with? Mm -hmm. And is that something that we need to approve or to, to work on, or is that an administrative piece? I would say if you if you have any suggestions to, um, you could send them to. I could give them quickly right here. Just three things if I can. Sure, um, I'll take them down. Yeah. Because I would say to vote on this when we come through with the time frame that okay. they've recommended. Sure. Um, so the application as I see it in our packet has grades one through five. Mm -hmm. I think kindergarten students participate in open enrollment, so okay. I, I'd like to see that. The second bullet point, transportation must be provided by the parent. Mm -hmm. I would only add and not at the cost of the school district. In other words, I don't want to see a parent saying, well, I'm paying for a bus so um, we can bus a kid or somehow, which would be extremely difficult. But if there was a busing situation, I just want to make sure that that's excluded. If it's open enrollment, the parent is solely responsible or solely responsible mm -hmm. um, for the transportation. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, towards the bottom, and I know that there's been a lot of um, consternation over the years and, and um, dialogue about um, first come, first served. And I know we're getting away from that, and I'm yep. happy we're getting Taking away from that. Taking that out. And I wish we would, um, I would ask if we could put that specifically in here where it says decision will be made at the discretion of the superintendent in the second to last line and not based upon first come, first served so that it's expressly Action. stated. Actually, through through the chair to you, that is one of the changes that I'm going to recommend on the policy, the policy I saw that. because in the policy, um, if you can hang on for one second, I could read it to you. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, here it is. Right in front of me. Um, under line A on the policy, which is on the next page, yep. the line that will be deleted will be the superintendent of schools will act upon this rest request in order of its receipt. Yep. What's going to go in its place as far as a recommendation at the moment. The request must be made on the form open enrollment application, which will be provided by the school department. Then under section B, it hopefully will read, request must be made annually using the open enrollment application and submitted during the open enrollment application period. And by taking out in section A, in order of its receipt, that is one of the that is one of the criteria that people relied upon as first come first serve. Every application will be received during a specific date, time time definite, and then each application is going to be evaluated on its merits, with no regard to who came in first or second. Through the, through the mayor too, Ms. Dunn. I, whole, I wholly support that. I'm just, I would just like to also see it on the application itself so that we don't have to continue referring to the policy that many parents may not go to that next step. Mm -hmm. And if we want to talk about the policy, I do have one other, one other mm -hmm. but I don't know if you were talking about the policy tonight. I don't know if you've presented an amended policy or, or if you plan to at a future meeting. Actually, yes, but I'd be glad to have it come right now. It's okay. Yeah, so again, just to, to through the mayor, if I may. Yeah, please. Thank you, uh, to Ms. Dunn. Uh, paragraph, subparagraph E, which talks about the limitations of the Federation contract. Again, this should solely be at the, super in, the, the discretion of the superintendent. There shouldn't be any extraneous um, factors. The, the superintendent is aware of those limitations. I don't know that it needs to be part of a policy that anyone else needs to consider. I think that he or she, whoever that person will be, will have a, a, a complete and comprehensive grasp of what the limitations are that exist in his or her decision making when it comes to open enrollment. I think that was put in due to concerns that if a classroom was going to be overcrowded based upon our contract, that 
we would never remove a child who was enrolled under an open enrollment to allow another student into that spot. Yeah. Um, that one we probably do need to look into. But I know that was why it was originally put in. It was to maintain the class sizes. No, and I, I agree with that. I think we need, we obviously need to adhere to the collective bargaining agreement. I just think that the superintendent's aware of that and it doesn't need to be codified further in a policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, thank you for that thank report, you. those questions. Mm -hmm. All right, if there's no objection, I'd like to go, uh, we have Glenn Kucher from the Mass Association of School Committees. Mm -hmm. I know we have a number of people here uh, interested in our superintendent search. Um, there's no objection. I'd like to go to that item. No objection. No objection. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Kucher, could you please come up? As uh, many of you are aware, we uh, initiated the process of uh, the superintendent search. Um, as we did the last search, we asked for assistance from the Massachusetts Association of School Committees. Glenn Kucher uh, was with us last time, kind of uh, organizing the search for us, the process, uh, assisting us with documentation, the planning, um, and all the procedures that we needed to follow. I'm very glad that Glenn Kucher is with us again. Uh, he's here tonight. Uh, I was very pleased the closing of the um, applications was February 28th. We had 33 applicants for the school superintendent position, which I was very pleased at the large amount of applicants. It was larger than the last time we had our search uh, a couple of years back. Um, I think that says something that people are interested in our district. So uh, out of those 33, we did have a meeting, um, an executive session meeting last week. Uh, at that time, we did not discuss candidates. Uh, we provided the applications of those candidates uh, to the school committee members. I provided those. Um, uh, Mr. Kucher uh, assisted me with that. And we decided on the process in which we will be moving forward with the superintendent search. Uh, this was decided by the school committee that we were going to follow the process uh, that we did last time. Uh, we are going to be deciding on a number of applicants today to be interviewed. Uh, we've set time for next week, Monday and Wednesday evening. Uh, to have the uh, interviews of the potential candidates. Uh, depending on the number we decide on, uh, we could go additional days, but right now we've locked in on Monday, March 16th, and Wednesday, March 18th as interview days. Um, I think we're going to have to have those interviews here as the Wigan Auditorium uh, does there is some conflict, so uh, that'll be announced shortly um, as to the location, but I think they're going to be here at the middle school. Um, right here in this library, uh, uh, the same spot that we're at tonight. So um, we had 33 applicants. I provided uh, the resumes, the information that were provided uh, in the application, again with the assistance of the Massachusetts Asso Association of School Committees. Uh, what we have to decide as a school committee is how many candidates we want to interview and those candidates that we will be reaching out to to learn more about <coughs> and have them come in for an interview. Uh, the school committee will be uh, be the um, uh, doing those interviews as we did last time, uh, either uh, here most likely or at City Hall in the Wigan Auditorium. Questions will be um, asked by the school committee to the applicant and certainly anybody who um, has questions that they think would be helpful to us during the process, uh, please reach out to either myself or to the school committee members. Um, so I would open it up now to the school committee uh, as to uh, candidates, what I was thinking is to uh, ask each school committee member uh, the uh, list of the candidates that they would like to learn more about, to hear from in an interview, and I think we should just do it as a majority of people who um, we each select would be the ones that we reach out to, whether it's five, six, seven, however the committee feels about the number. Before we open it up, Mr. Miko. Did you have a question? I, oh, I just wanted to start. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mr. Olympio. Um, so, Mr. Kucha, that's what we were thinking of. Uh, I was I presented as an option to us. Um, um, school committee has had now since Wednesday uh, the resumes, the documentation uh, that was provided to us. Um, Mr. Hockman, did you want to jump in before we go forward? Yes, please, in terms of the process. Yes. Um, 
I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're suggesting. However, um, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily know that I would start with by saying that a, a, a applicant who receives a majority of the vote of the school committee to go forward gets an interview. I think it would be six. I, I wouldn't want to see more than six applicants okay. move forward, my personal opinion, for interviews. So there could be six, unless um, could there was a tie. tie or, yep. If there was a tie, then we I think round up and not down. But if there were six applicants who received six votes to move forward, I think that that's what we go with. If there were seven, we'd move with seven. Um, but I wouldn't want to take six who get six votes, three who get five votes, and one or two that get four votes, which would be a majority. That's, that very, that's very fair. So I would ask each of the school committee members to give us, provide six candidates that they would be inter interested in interviewing and bringing towards. Six or seven? Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, you got seven? Okay. <laughs> six or seven. Okay. Mr. Miko? Great. Can I start? <laughs> no further comments. We'll open up. Mr. Miko, you want to start you. us off? Mr. Kusha, thank you so much for uh, helping us with this. Um, this is an in impressive list of candidates, uh, the 33 that we received. Um, We've all had a uh, opportunity to go through. Um, if I could, I'd like to list my seven. Yep. And the reason why I'm going to say seven is, um, as Mr. Kusha would, would uh, acknowledge as well, um, Linfield, Melrose, Hamilton, Wenham, and other districts nearby are also going through a superintendent search. And from past practices and past experience, um, finalists become new hires very quickly. And I'd like to have, because we have such an impressive pool of candidates, I'd like to get as many of these candidates in front of us for that initial interview um, and then move, move forward uh, with our finalists from there. But um, So I'm going to bring forward seven. These are mine. Um, in no particular order, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ekins Ryan, Dr. Omar Easy, Mr. Thomas Flanagan, Dr. Julie Kuchenberger, Dr. Christopher Lord, Dr. Arthur Ubunoski, and Dr. Josh Vidala. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe there were seven. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Amico. Why don't we just go down uh, voting order? Mr. Arnotis? Thank you. This will be easy there, similar. Um, Melissa Eakins Ryan, Dr. Omar Easy, uh, Mr. Thomas Flanagan, Julie Kuchenberger, Dr. Christopher Lord, Arthur, Dr. Arthur Ubowski, and Dr. Josh Fidel. That's okay. Seven. Thank you. Mrs. Carpenter? Thank you. Um, so I have Melissa Eakins Ryan, Omar Easy, Thomas Flanagan, Lori Gallivan, Chris Lord, Arthur Ubanowski, and Joss Vidala. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hockman? Thank you, and again, in no particular order, um, Lori Gallivan, Nan Murphy, Josh Vidala, Arthur Ubanowski. Ubanowski. Sorry. Uh, and Julie Kuchenberger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olympio? Yeah. No particular order. Uh, Melissa Askins Ryan, Om, uh, Mr. Omar Easy, uh, Mr. Thomas Flanagan, uh, Dr. Christopher Lord, uh, let's see, Dr. Uh, Arthur Urbanski, and, jo and Dr. Uh, Josh uh, Vidalia. Can I? Is that Unovsky? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Olympio. Mrs. Dunn? Okay. Again, no particular order. Dr. Christopher Lord, Omar Easy, Josh Vidala, Laurie Gallivan, Thomas Flanagan, Julie Kuchenberger. All right. So I have right now, um, it would be Ian, 
Eakins Ryan with four, Omar Easy five, Thomas Flanagan five, Julie Kuchenberger four, Chris Lord five, Arthur Yunopsky five, and Josh Vidala six, uh, Laurie Gallivan three, and Nan Murphy one. So that would put us, um, there's five candidates and a tie for six between Eakins Ryan and Kuchenberger. And um, I would think that we should interview both if it's a tie, as we decided. So that leaves us seven candidates. Um, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to advance the seven candidates who receive those, the votes you've identified. Okay. Further motion by Mr. Hockman uh, to move forward uh, with request for interviews with those six candidates, excuse me, those seven candidates, seconded by Mr. Olympio. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 And for the record, Mr. Chairman, could you read the final names yep. again? This is, uh, these are the names I have um, uh, in alphabetical order. Uh, Melissa Eakins-Ryan, Omar Easy, Thomas Flanagan, Julie Kuchenberger, Chris Lord, Arthur Yunopsky, and Josh Vidala. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kucher, so um, could we set up interviews with these seven uh, candidates for Monday and Tuesday, excuse me, one day, Monday and Wednesday next week? We Looking can. To, we can? Can we set up interviews for um, six, seven, and eight o'clock on one of the days, and then on the other day, 5.30, 6.30, 7.30, and 8.30? Yes. Mr. Busey, are you aware of any, if there's any um, potential conflict if we were to use this library for those interviews Monday next week and Wednesday next week? Okay. So why don't we just plan to have those interviews here? Um, I know there's an event at City Hall on um, Monday. So um, Mr. Kucher, we'll be in touch, and if we could, you know, right away reach out and try to lock those dates in. Uh, what I'm probably going to do, well, well, I'll be in touch with them all and we'll try to schedule them very quickly. That shouldn't be a problem. I'm not sure which day will be the date of four versus the date of three, but I would just ask everyone to be ready to be here at 530 and I'll try to have the schedule out to you uh, possibly as early as before the end of the day tomorrow. Great. These calls always tend to get returned, so I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would think. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kutcher. Great. Okay. Anything can else? I uh, also say, if, if you want, I can forward to you, uh, I may have already done that, Mr. Chairman, uh, question guides, sample interviews. People on the school committee are generally free to ask whatever they like. Uh, and. Uh, leave that up to you but I do we do have some resources that are available to you so we, yeah that'd be very helpful maybe I'll, I'll uh, yeah. uh, I can probably send them to the superintendent well you could send it to me I'll and send I can them to you and you yeah. can forward them to the school committee I can let's do that okay so this will be next <coughs> Monday next Monday the 16th and next so Wednesday the I, I believe those are the dates that we had tentatively asked people to save Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Okay. All right. We'll go back to public participation. Uh, on the agenda, is anyone in the audience that would like to come forward and speak? Their opportunity to come forward. Please. If you could just introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Paige Baker. I live at 13 Sunset Drive. I go here at Higgins, Higgins Middle School. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, what I have previously brought up in past meetings 
and some additional comments. Um, first, I don't, I don't really understand why school community, ke community keeps calling this a personal matter for the what I brought up for about the art room uh, incident uh, when 30 students are not per, uh, personnel. I am disappointed by the superintendent's comments because he keeps trying to make it about my mom and I when it's about everyone in the, everyone that was in that classroom. I am not allowed to say anything during his res res report and I want to let him know that his words will be used against him. And I was always taught to own what I say or do. Nobody, nobody will uh, give us information in, no one will give us information how, information on this and how would uh, my mother and I know something like this will not happen in the future. It's honestly discouraging that people on the school committee are not sticking up for students and living up to what they say. You are not, oh, hmm, sorry. <laughs> you only want to look for the good things at the schools, but you do not want to fix or confront the bad things to make the schools better, to make the schools a better place. Also, I would like to comment on, um, I would also like to comment that on page 11 on February 25th meeting uh, for minutes, section five, Miss Dunn uh, moved uh, move to receive uh, the document provided by Miss Baker, uh, seconded by Mr. Hockman, and it was all in favor and, motions, and the motion was carried. Uh, that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak of public participation? Seeing none, we'll go to superintendent's report. Dr. Kerbel. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to number four because the first three have been um, talked about earlier. Yep. And this has to do with surplus furniture. And so there's um, a letter. That, be, that I would like to bring to your attention from Joseph Scanlon. It says the administration at the high school has determined that the excess furniture currently stored on the bus ramp are considered, excuse me, surplus and are of no use to the high school. So in accordance with chapter 30B, I would like to request that the school committee declare this furniture surplus. All efforts will be made to sell, donate, the furniture of schools within the district or other district organizations in need. Looking for a motion to declare that surplus, Mrs. Dunn? So moved. Second, yeah. you've heard the motion by Mrs. Dunn, uh, seconded by Mr. Hockman. All in favor? I think we have to take a roll Should call. Should we do a roll call vote, I guess? Yes. 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 Thank you, Dr. Kerr. Okay. Uh, with, the, <clears throat> with great appreciation, I would like the school committee to accept a $36 donation from Dan's Auto Body to Caring in the Healing Committee for their pizza day. And I, I just want to stop right there for a second. We had a, a pizza day at the high school and at the middle school, and uh, with great success. And um, and so we had, we had the auto body shop donate $36. We also had other contributions, which you've accepted at earlier school committee meetings. Um, so I wanna thank them. Let's see. Um, also, I'd like the school committee to accept a check for $408.05 from the Higgins Destination Imagination Pajama Day to the Caring and Healing Committee, and that that amount of money would be used for the Healing Garden, which should hopefully open up uh, in June. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kerbel. So we'll take those individually, the uh, motion to receive 
with gratitude the donation from Dan's Auto Body. Um, motion made by Mr. Amico, seconded by Mr. Arnotis. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 And, and also the donation um, from Salem 5 for the Higgins Destination Imagination Pajama Day uh, in the amount of $408.05. Motion made by Mr. Arnotis, seconded by Mrs. Carpenter. Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 And just a point of information, can we make sure that in the minutes that that, that donation is from the Higgins destination team, not from Salem 5? Okay. Oh, Salem 5 is, the, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the DI team, Higgins DI team. Okay. okay. Yep. Uh, I want to thank the middle school students. Uh, for making Pajama Day a success. Uh, next, I want to talk about the uh, camp invention. There's a letter from me, I mean to me, from uh, Lauren King, the Brown School principal. There's a letter about um, the Brown School hosting camp invention the week of June 29th, 2020. And very briefly, camp invention is, nas is a, um, a nationally acclaimed summer program where STEM concepts come to life and curious campers are turned into innovators. So we'll have local teachers be involved, uh, the school principal will be involved, and um, so I, the, the rest of the letter is there for you. The more I get information, I'll give it to you. There's some literature in the packet that you can look at. Um, one of the things I would like to do would be, if we can, uh, because the camp is expensive, $260 per week. It'd be great to get sponsors of students who cannot afford to go to the camp. Um, one of the things we're looking at would be the building fee. And that, um, so we're looking at maybe the building fee to be waived and use that money for scholarships. But there might be someone out there that'd be interested in sponsoring students um, so they could attend camp invention. Uh, next thing I'd like to do is talk about the 2020 uh, and 2021, which is really the next school year calendar. I want to thank uh, Maj Maccarelli for her due diligence in terms of putting this together. It's a first draft, so I would like you to take a look at this. Do you have comments now? Um, do you want to talk about any changes? or the next time we can talk about the changes, but at least this is the first pass, and I'm not quite sure in terms of your process, how many times it has to go before, is it twice or three times, the calendar has to be accepted by the committee. I think it's up to the school committee um, okay. as to their wishes. Do you want to uh, take this in and put it on for the next school committee meeting for a vote? Um, I'll leave it up to the members. Thank you. Mr. Sure. Miko. I'd like to take it in and uh, make sure that we have professional development um, based in there, um, religious holidays and everything else that we, we've done in the past. I know if, if Ms. Marge Marcarelli put this together, it's probably as good as it's going to get, but if we could have a couple of opportunities to just take a peek at it, that would be great. Thank you. I would say the everything is in here, and uh, but we may maybe we missed a day, you never know. So if there's, if there's anything that comes up, let us know, please. Thank you. Okay. Mm -mm. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, to the Chair, Dr. Kerbel, has this, have you gone over this at all with the union? We generally do a pass by with them. Yes. No comments back? I haven't received any comments, okay? But um, I, um, I, I ran to the union president. She was reviewing it with the high school um, secretary, and so I did not hear back. Uh, but now you're making me question myself. All right, so <laughs> no, but, we'll put it on again. Yeah, it, right. We usually run it through okay. a few times Thanks. for a lot of a lot of different eyes on it. Help yeah. make it accurate. I, I think a lot of eyes have looked at this. Yeah, I, I went through all the principles. Uh, Great. So if we can just put it on so again, that would be good. Yeah. I think okay. it's gone through a lot of scrutiny. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Dunn? I know there was um, discussion of doing a, the following. That's next. The following. We're trying yeah. to get two years out. And right. come up with the next school committee <coughs> meeting. So mm -hmm. we can have people planning uh, 18 to 22 months ahead for vacations, planning. We get ticket tickets and uh, 
Anyway, so you'll have the 2021-22 school year at the next meeting to get all that out. And hopefully it will be in your dialogue every time. And for the record, I think that is one of the best suggestions I've ever heard in all the time I've been on the school committee. And it's a simple thing, but it would be so helpful for many people. Great. Well, I want, excuse me, I want to thank Dr. Lord for pushing it. <laughs> it's a great idea. Great. I've got family staying. I want to book my vacation a year from now. Mr. Mayor, just to... Yes, I'm sorry, Mr. Hockman. Yeah, just to throw it out there, and I think that that's absolutely, a, I agree with Ms. Dunn, a fantastic idea. The further we can get out, the better we are for planning. One of the things that impacts families' abilities to, and staff members' abilities to go on trips during our vacation weeks is that um, we're gouged by airlines and uh -huh. hotels and car rental places. So I would like to see, and perhaps uh, I can make a motion at the next meeting, but throw out the idea that the uh, Finance Committee perhaps impact bargain with the various bargaining units to eliminate the February and April vacations and uh, put in one vacation in March, which will also accomplish everybody getting out a week earlier in June or maybe going to school a week later and not starting in August like this proposed calendar has us doing, but going to school in September. And everyone always cherishes those um, summer days that are, are fleeting in New England. And um, it's uncomfortable in some schools because not all schools have HVAC. And um, I, I feel for students and staff that have to go to school in late June um, or late August uh, when there's no air conditioning. and. So I'm not going to make a motion tonight, but I just want to throw it out there because it is something I do plan to talk about as a possible um, change to the typical schedule. And I do like to see that we're changing the way we do business a little bit and going two years out. You know, uh, and, and I think that there's a, a fair resolution to this if we can all get to the table. Thank you, Mr. Huckman. All right, Dr. Kerbel, thank you for your report. We'll go to written communications. There are two written communications today. One is from the PBD Veterans Council regarding our Memorial Day activities on Monday, May 25th, 2020. And also communication from DESE, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education regarding the school choice reporting requirements. Um, any comment or question on those before we receive those two documents? Okay. Motion made by Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, to receive those two documents, seconded by Mrs. Dunn. All in favor? That's a vote. Okay, subcommittee reports. Education, Mr. Hockman? Uh, no report at this time. Okay. Thank you. Finance, Mrs. Carpenter? Nothing to report. School safety, Mr. Olympio? Uh, nothing new to report. Athletics and wellness, Mr. Hockman? Yes, we have a tentative meeting scheduled for Monday, March 23rd at 5.30 p.m. in the conference room at... Uh, the school administration building at 27 Lowell Street. Um, as we firm up the time with all the invitees, we will post. Terrific, thank you. Quality and standards, Mrs. Dunn? Nothing to report at this time. Parent and student advisory boards, Mrs. Dunn? Nothing to report at this time. Building and grounds, Mr. Amico? Um, just one thing, through the chair to uh, Central Officer Dr. Kerbel, could we just get an update on our exterminators that we use for uh, buildings, I've had some complaints about, um, and I, I don't know if there's any way around it, they're everywhere, um, mice, and um, it seems to, uh, especially with the warmer weather, they're all over the place. But um, if we could just get a, a, a report on who we use for an exterminator and what methods we're using. I guess there was a report at the high school and at one of the elementary schools as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I did want to report at this time, um, on Thursday, March 26th, uh, I'll be appearing in front of the City Council. There's been a request to discuss city-owned property. Um, I anticipate that one of the properties will be the Kylie School, and I'll be addressing that at that time uh, with my feelings. Um, and I know at some point we've had some discussions that we'll be taking that up shortly. Um, I just wanted to report if you wanted to join uh, at that meeting. And point of information, that's also the meeting they're going to uh, hear our statement of interest request for the center and the high school. Terrific. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Special Education Parent Advisory Board, Mr. Olympio? Uh, nothing new to report. City Council and legisl Legislative Delegation, Mr. Arnotis? Nothing new to report. Okay, we did have one item under new business uh, that I brought forward at the last meeting was the school choice vote. Uh, I think I've always been very clear um, 
or at least the last couple of years in this during this discussion that um, although I was supportive of school uh, the um, open enrollment um, that I think does work uh, for a um, number of families here in the city and uh, at the discretion of the superintendent uh, to make those decisions. Um, I do not believe in school choice. Uh, again, I want to be clear in terms of the difference. Open enrollment would allow for people, families who live in the city of Peabody uh, to potentially have their child go to an elementary school that is outside the district and, and where they, they should be going or they would be going. Um, again, that would be decided by the uh, superintendent. School choice is different. School choice would be allowing students from other cities and towns to apply to the city of Peabody to go to school here. Um, some years ago, we opened, uh, we had that uh, school choice decision, and um, I support it at the time. I don't think that is the appropriate way to go now. Uh, we need to make a decision on that. I would say, though, um, that students that are already here, their younger siblings uh, would be welcome to the city of Peabody and for uh, teachers, administrative, administrators, our staff, uh, that their um, uh, children would be able to come to the school here uh, again with this approval of the superintendent. So, but those would be the only two um, examples that I, I think that school choice, excuse me, that school choice would work for the city of Peabody. Otherwise, uh, I would not be supportive of uh, allowing students from other districts to come to the city of Peabody. That's just my feeling. Again, that's a school committee vote. Mr. Miko. Thank you. Through the chair, and I agree with you, Mayor. Um, on one issue, would, the, would that stop students from leaving Peabody as well? No. Is, is, there, a, is there an all or nothing in this, in this law? Or through the chair, uh, Dr. No, Kerbel? No, I, I'll defer to Joe, uh, to Joe Scanlon about the numbers, okay? But I think that if you have, um, I think students can leave, okay? But which means that uh, we would lose that, we would lose the revenue coming in, and we lose the revenue leaving. Can you answer that, Joe? Joe, on the uh, uh, school, school choice. choice. If we did not have school choice, any idea how much money, how much revenue we would not take in? How much would we lose? Well, I mean, the school nope. choice numbers are um, have been issued for uh, 20. Uh, we talked about it just a little bit at the last meeting. The numbers are still, <clears throat> they're, they're substantially lower, but uh, they're still positive. We have um, roughly 87 coming in versus, you know, 60 or so going out. So it's um, 670 coming in and, you know, 490 or so going out. So it, it's all... Um, depending on the, the seniors in each of the grades that I can lay it out, I haven't yet, but I'll lay it out in terms of what will happen to school choice over the next few years. If yeah, we, go ahead. If we didn't have school choice, if we did not take in any more students, if we didn't take any students in FY21, how much would we lose? I, I don't think that was if, a question yeah, that Mr. Miller was asking. Maybe I but. could just restate my question. So. So basically, what the mayor had suggested is keeping school choice open for um, children who are already here and their siblings, and also for administrators or teachers who want to bring their kids here. My question is, is it an all or nothing? If we vote against school choice, do we eliminate it completely? Oh, or can we set parameters in there for who comes? And if we set parameters on who comes, does that mean we can lose students to other districts? So I guess that's my question is, is school choice all or nothing or can we set some rules on our end? And I don't think we can. I think it's all or nothing. And yeah, Mark, I would comment on that. That is true in terms of having any sort of open acceptance program. That's what you're uh, voting to accept. If we don't take in any students, one of the things we need to do for the FY21 budget is to adjust the offset uh, for school choice because it's set at a number that is not being achieved anymore. So we would have to lower the offset or back it out of the budget all together. That's the really only harmful point financially about school choice. 
Yeah, and, 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 and I would debate that in terms of uh, that being a net loss to the city of Peabody. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with that. The school choice number would go down, but there are other factors that come into play um, where I, I don't think it would be um, a financial hit for us. Um, Mr. Miko, you still have the floor, then I'll go to Mr. Hockman. So I guess I'm still unclear. I would vote no on school choice, but if that would mean that would eliminate parent, uh, teachers and administrators from bringing their own kids or eliminating the kids that we already have here and possibly their siblings, then I'm, I'm going to need a little bit more time on that. So I guess I'm not really, Mr. it, it Mayor, all depends on the, on the state, I, I guess it's a state law or a rule in this case. Point of information yep. if I may. Mr. Was, yeah, I was just trying to respond to Mr. Amico if I could through you. Uh, first of all, our students have the opportunity to attend school in any, any school district that votes in favor of school choice. So they're not excluded. If we, if we decide not to take students in, our students still have the opportunity to go to other districts so long as they vote in favor of school choice. Okay. So that they're, they're not impacted whatsoever. My understanding of school choice is that um, we, we don't, the, the parameters as you're describing that are put on um, who comes in if we elect to have people come in requires a positive vote for school choice and then it becomes at the discretion of the superintendent and we can um, as we did last year, make it very clear to the superintendent what those parameters are, and our um, recourse is to fire the superintendent. So if the superintendent doesn't follow the direction of the school committee, we can't prevent a kid from coming in, but we can eliminate the uh, superintendent and hire another superintendent. And if you want to read about that, Andrew Jackson did that quite a bit in establishing the National Bank when he was president well. of the United States. But that's our recourse. We either vote, if we vote no, we cannot permit any student that's already here, we're, we, we own and we keep. Uh, any sibling we're not permitted to take in. Any staff member that has a student, a child, or, or uh, that they're a caregiver for, that isn't already here wouldn't be able to come in. We would need to vote in the affirmative on school choice in order to allow that to happen and set those parameters. And Ms. Murtag was very clear with those parameters and, and comfortable with them. Um, and again, that the recourse we have is the removal of the superintendent and a vote, um, which I'm not suggesting, but I'm saying that's our recourse. <laughs> Dr. Kerbel? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So, and my experience with school choice is you, you can't cherry pick who comes in. You'll have school choice, it's first come, it's first, come first serve. And that's, that's my experience has been. Um, okay. Mr. Olympio? Yeah, no, for the chair, I agree with Mr. Jackson on that. <laughs> 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 no, that, is, that has been, at least since I've been on the board, uh, that's been our understanding that we voted in favor of it, but the superintendent, yeah, for lack of a better word, knows the marching orders as far as who they, they have in the past cherry-picked uh, administrators, okay. teachers, ch uh, children, uh, existing students and siblings. So, yeah, that's, that's to what Mr. Hockman said. That's been, I think, the way we've practiced over the past uh, three, four years at least. Okay. Mrs. Carpenter? Yeah, in, in addition to that, which I do believe is true, um, when we first did it, we did cherry pick. We did it just to fill certain class sizes and class in schools that had extra room in those, those classes. So the superintendent was, um, it was suggested to the superintendent that maybe he or she fill up certain grades. Um, so if, if we vote no on school choice, there will be no siblings that will be allowed to come in for any staff that already have a children, children here. We have to vote yes in order to um, allow any, any type of student to enter. And then it would just be up to the superintendent to hear our wishes. Any other comments, Mrs. Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, following up on, on a request about the, the actual, um, the dollars and cents on this, I, I would be interested in seeing, you know, what, 
use this year as an example what the um, amount of funds that we had to send out of the district, what the amount of funds were that were brought in by students coming into the district, and then it sounds like there are other costs that we don't necessarily know about when we make this decision. I would like to know what the actual cost is of this program because if we have a net loss, then I can, I can, I can see that uh, being very pertinent. Um, and, and I do think we need to get very firm answers on what the parameters are of our vote as far as being able to um, have either an all or nothing type of a situation because um, I do believe that even if we stopped school choice right now, people who are here on school choice are allowed to complete their education. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to know, you know some, of those, some of those different details before making a final decision. All right, why don't we hold this to the next meeting, firm this up with our city solicitor and um, double check this. I, my understanding is, as, as Mr. Hockman laid it out, um, very well, but let's confirm that, um, make sure we know what um, the vote requires and what would what the effect would be. Okay. All right. All right, our next meeting is uh, March 24th, Tuesday, March 24th. We'll adjourn till then. So moved. So moved. Per the motion by Mr. Harkman. Seconded Monday. by Mr. Arnotis. Yes, we'll have uh, Monday and Wednesday. <laughs>